Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Pat, DeGracia Daniels, and Erwin Stirr. Coming up on DTNS, a new MacBook Air, an M2 chip, and all the rest of the big announcements from Apple's WWDC keynote, plus hope for more efficient car battery technology. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, June 6th in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Oh, and... uh... I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Of course, joining us also is Terrence Gaines from Snob OS. How's it going, Terrence? Hey, how's it going, everybody? We are uh, hoping to have Nika Monford, your co-host, on, but uh, our, our software seems to not be cooperating. She keeps bopping in and out, so we'll try to get her back on as soon as we can. Uh, I'll keep an eye out for her, but it's good to have you. Uh, are, are you excited to, to, to talk some operating systems there is a lot. There is definitely a lot. There's definitely a lot that I'm pretty sure a lot of people are interested in. Like I mentioned earlier, it sounds like Apple said, OK, this is the stuff you guys want versus <laughs> this is the stuff we think you need. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is kind of an Apple like from the in a way. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Before we get to all those Apple announcements, we have a few other stories. LastPass started rolling out the ability to use this authenticator app to access a password vault on desktop rather than using that master password. Master passwords will still be required for registering an account, adding new trusted devices, making account changes, or if a passwordless attempt fails. Epic Games will distribute its first blockchain-based game on the Epic Games Store later this year. It'll be the Western-themed Battle Royale Grit from Gala Games. Gala plans to publish more of its existing catalog on the Epic Games Store in the future. In a letter to Twitter, Elon Musk's attorney, Mike Ringler, accused the company of resisting and thwarting Musk's right to information on fake accounts on the platform, calling it a, quote, clear material breach of the merger agreement. The letter maintains that Twitter is obligated to provide data for any reasonable business purpose related to the consummation of the transaction. So that's what buyer's remorse looks like. Uh, Google agreed to pay $100 million to Illinois residents as a settlement for a class action lawsuit alleging that Google Photos facial recognition violated the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act. Uh, That law uh, forbids collecting biometric data without making individuals aware in writing and telling how long the company is going to keep it. Residents that appear in photos or videos in Google Photos from May 1st to 2015 to April 25th, 2022 have until September 24th of this year to submit their claim. A final hearing is scheduled on September 28th. Chinese state media reports that the floor covering and wall panel provider Power Decor became the first company in Chongqing, China, to pay taxes with the digital yuan. China rolled out a pilot of its virtual currency in the city back in April, and the city surpassed one million digital wallets in May. In other taxation news, Gold Coast Australia Mayor Tom Tate said that the city is researching accepting Bitcoin for local tax payments. He said this would send a signal that we're innovative and bring in the younger generation. Oh, the kids. Bringing in the kids. All right. Apple does tend to suck all the water out of the news lake uh, when they do an announcement. We, <laughs> we, we have an interesting thing about batteries here we want to touch on real quick. Yeah, we do. So lithium ion batteries, uh, you probably have a device that <laughs> is running one of those, usually use a liquid electrolyte solution. That limits the density of the battery. So they're good, but they are limited. An alternative is a ceramic battery that has no liquid, I can pack more energy into a smaller space. One option is organic polymers. They're cheap, they're easy to make, but they don't have the needed performance that a lot of people are looking for. Another option is using materials like sulfides and oxides. They're brittle and they're hard to manufacture at a large scale. So lots of options, but limitations for all. Well, a Colorado company called Solid Power thinks they have found a way to make those sulfide-based solid-state batteries at scale and deal with those brittle brittle issues. So they're starting large-scale pilot manufacturing to prove it. The test line has capacity for around 15,000 cells per year. So this isn't mass producing for like selling cars, but it's enough to be able to do a bunch of test vehicles. Uh, This allows batteries that use alternative chemistry like lithium metal or silicon, which are unstable or unsafe with liquid electrolytes, 
but are much safer with these solid state. Uh, even regular lithium ion chemistry would benefit with energy densities that could allow 500 miles on a charge at the same size as current batteries allow 350 miles. Uh, also a benefit of these is solid batteries charge faster and are non-flammable. Uh, they also need fewer temperature controls and safety systems because of that. That makes them cheaper to make uh, and save space. So you not only get a more dense energy, you don't need as much space for each individual battery package because you don't need all of the safety controls that a lithium-ion liquid electrolyte battery needs. But there are some other challenges, right? Yeah, there are. So aside from whether or not solid can overcome some of these manufacturing challenges is whether the batteries withstand degradation over time, which is something that all battery manufacturers have to deal with, as well as liquid electrolyte batteries. If all goes well, Solid thinks it can deliver batteries for its partners, BMW and Ford, to test later this year and get formal automotive qualification. Solid also eventually wants to get the technology certified so it can sell the material to other battery makers. Solid Power hopes to be able to make enough material for 800,000 cars per year by 2028. So not tomorrow, but on the horizon. I don't know, cheaper, safer batteries that uh, can go longer than existing batteries. Terrence, I'm cheering for them. Uh, I hope they, they make it work. So this is, the, in my opinion, sounds like the Theranos effect. Oh, no. <laughs> and what I mean by that is wow, <laughs> this is a major big, this is a big claim. And if only they could have proved it. So I think Solid uh, thinks they have a, a solution, but they're really going to have to prove it because I think we have been burned by previous attempts at major big claims, right? Yeah, yeah, especially yeah. in batteries. You're, you're not wrong about that. The, the, the things that make me a little more, a lot, let me just say, a lot more confident than I was about Theranos uh, <laughs> is that they, they are doing manufacturing and they've got right. partnerships with automobile companies. Uh, you're not wrong. Proof's in the pudding. Let's, let's see these things hit the road. Uh, but they have they've gotten out of the lab at least, and that that's that's very positive. And I don't I don't, I don't think they're lying like Theranos. I mean, I guess I could be proven wrong. <laughs> they got to prove it now. They've yeah, already yeah. been we've already been burned. So it's like no, we are we, we are on it. the way to proving it though, which yeah. is good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I would I would like to have a, a a car that can go 500 miles with a battery that won't explode. I'm exactly. Very much into that. Well, uh, yeah, it seems like a yeah you know getting a leg up. On the yeah. battery manufacturing. Now, if you're into EVs, you might be into solar power as well. If you're thinking of adding solar panels to your home, then you need to listen to our solar panel roundtable we put together. Uh, myself, Sarah, and uh, some some guests. One from the industry, one who's a DIYer, one who just recently installed it on a suburban home. Uh, explain the process, the things you need to consider, what you can expect to spend, what you can expect to save. It's coming to your feed this Saturday, but if you want it sooner... You can support the show through Patreon, and you'll get it now. It's already out for the patrons, so go support us at patreon.com slash DTNS. Well, we know that most of y'all are thinking about Apple kicking off its Worldwide Developer Conference Monday with the usual keynote address. Now, usually, WWDC is just operating systems, but for the first time since 2017, we have some hardware announcements. So let's start with the new chip, M2. Five nanometer process, 20 billion transistors. They say it's got 18% greater performance than the M1. They threw out a lot of other benchmarks that didn't have like really good, they, like they never labeled their X and Y access. So I feel like that's the solid one. If they're saying it's 18% better than the one we already have, that's that's a pretty good way to benchmark it. Uh, four high performance, four efficiency cores. The GPU now goes up to 10 cores. And uh, one of the things that stuck out to me is it can support 8K H.264 video, so you can do multiple streams of both 8K and 4K. Uh, Tara, uh, or Sarah, uh, would, would, are you excited <laughs> before we get to where they put the M2 uh, about the M2? I'm excited because we've been hearing about the M2 for some time. Uh, it's great to have uh, a hardware space that it lives. I was, uh, thanks to DTNS, uh, its parent company, so brilliant, I was able to get uh, the M1 MacBook Air, which was, uh, you know, one of the first M1s that anybody really had. Uh, that was, gosh, two years ago now. And I mean, this thing cooks. 
Uh, I've been so happy with it. You know, the the novelty of like, oh, wow, you don't hear fan noise. Oh, wow, everything is so fast has kind of worn off a little bit. But man, you give me an M2. I don't really need a new laptop right now, but I want one. And that's what I was going to say. Uh, speaking of cooking, <laughs> how much more is this going to cook over an M1 or even to a greater extent an M1 Pro or an M1 Pro Max or is it M1 mm. Max? Yeah. Yeah, the max. I mean, how much how much significantly more, but on the flip side, we'll probably get to it a little bit later. The price for these may just say, why not get the best one? And Nika, we we finally got you in here. You before we get to the <laughs> MacBook Air, you got any thoughts on the M2? Um for me, I think it's more of if you're in the in the market for something, this is the time to buy. I personally wouldn't upgrade because my M1 Pro is pretty snappy for what I use it for. But I think it's more for folks who, if you're already in the market, you're looking for something, you might as well get the latest and greatest. Yeah, let's talk about the MacBook Air. It's got a squared off design, no more wedge. Uh, still, got, still got the MagSafe that the MacBook Pro had, which I guess is new to the air. Uh, headphone jack, two Thunderbolt ports, 13.6 inch display, uh, 11 millimeters thin, 2.7 pounds, four colors, no fan, 18 hour video playback battery life. Uh, and 1080p camera, Adobe Atmos spatial audio. New power adapter uh, comes with two USB-C ports, and the new MacBook Air supports fast charging. This one starts at $1,199. Uh, the M1 MacBook Air will stay on sale for $999, and then the MacBook Pro is going to stay the same, but they're going to start putting the M2 in it, so that's just a processor bump. Uh, that will start at a thousand three hundred ninety nine dollars, and all of this available next month. So, Sarah, now that now we've packaged it up, how do you feel? Well, you know, I, this might be sort of a funny detail, but because I'm an Air fan, I have I've had MacBook Airs for years, but I've also had MacBook Pros. Um, kind of use them in conjunction. The squared off design, rather than the wedge, it was sort of an interesting detail to me. I wonder if it's because Apple felt like they got enough feedback that people were like, mm, well, if you have the MacBook Air, you know, it doesn't look as pro as the MacBook Pro. So let's uh, let's get everything looking a little bit similar. I love the wedge. It's easy to fit into, you know, my variety of tote bags. Uh, but I, I guess that's, you know, it's kind of how I feel about the iPhone 13 as well. It's like, oh, squared off. Got it. Now, I was going to say, I think a lot of people liked the wedge. So I'd be interested to see. Of course, it's the Internet. Uh, people are going to complain about anything. So I'm interested to see how many people are going to complain about this new air not being a wedge. But on the flip side, I think people are going to love that black, uh, that matte black. I, w I don't know if it's matte black or shiny black, but I think people are going to like that different color. <laughs> Midnight. And I, yeah. yeah. And I think it yeah. also what goes do you think, into Apple's, I think it goes into Apple's whole lately. They've been on like the synchronicity type tour where they're trying to get everything, you know, aligned and looking look the, same the same across the platform. Yeah. And I think the MacBook Air was the last of the, the holdouts to get the new design. So it, it makes sense that they kind of moved it in to look a little bit more like the current line of, of MacBooks. Yeah, I'm curious why they announced this one at WWDC. Uh, my guess is because they can release it and they didn't want to wait, you know, for a couple more months. This this one's in the hopper and uh, with supply chains being what they are, once it's ready, you, you want to start selling it, right? Right. Because it's really not necessarily developer focused, um, but, you know. The, I guess it they, threw in, they threw in a few developer things as they yeah. were going through each of the the kind of bullet points of, of what they were offering. But again, this was definitely, to me, more consumer focused than developer focused. Conspiracy theory. Maybe they use this hardware to throw us off. No um, reality OS or the um, the reality augmented reality. <laughs> Apple glasses. It's, it's just a distraction. <laughs> yeah, here, here yeah. Give you, we'll give you something hardware. So show yeah, them about yeah, the other stuff. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, we also got new Mac OS. This was fully expected. The name is Ventura. Uh, one of the main new features coming is something called Stage Manager, uh, where Mission Control, Command Tab, and Launchpad have failed. Stage Manager is going to try uh, to win you over. It's a new way to organize your windows. This one moves all your windows to the side in a column on the left, except for your main app, which can be in the center, Although you can pair apps in piles, so you can have two to four 
apps together overlapping like a normal window with other groups of apps over on the left. Uh, you can click on your desktop to clear windows. We also got some improvements to Spotlight. Uh, you're going to be able to find images, search text inside images, start a timer from Spotlight, some richer results. Mail got undo send, scheduled send, uh, reminders for individual messages and some follow-up suggestions. Uh, Safari's big things were sharing tabs with friends so that you can both see the same tab set, uh, as well as the Fido stuff that we've talked about before on the show, pass keys. They've able to, the ability to use biometrics uh, to log in through Safari and sync in your keychain across all your Apple devices, as well as use those pass keys with an iPhone to log in on Microsoft and Google accounts. Uh, gaming is getting something called Metal 3. Uh, one of the aspects of that is upscaling metal effects. Upscaling lets you run at higher frame rates by rendering lower res frames and then upscaling them. No Man's Sky is going to come to macOS Ventura later this year using that. Uh, and something called Fast Resource Loading API that minimizes loading time. And finally, continuity. Uh, hand off FaceTime calls from your phone to your Mac. Uh, and I know, Terrence, this is one that you like, using your iPhone as a webcam uh, for your other Apple devices. I think it would work with the iPad as, as well as with the Mac. Uh, center stage portrait mode support, something called Studio Light to, to make your lighting a little more even. Uh, they are able to show a top-down view using that wide angle lens that is separate from the front view. So it's like a virtual top-down camera. And this will work not just with FaceTime, but with Zoom, with Microsoft Teams, and a few other devices. And Belkin's going to make some stands with MagSafe, so it'll be easy to pop them on top of a, a monitor or your, or your laptop uh, screen. Lots of stuff in here, Sarah. Anything in particular you loved? Well, Stage Manager, even though I'm not sure how much use I will make of it because I like my my dock and my my things all in a very specific way, I thought that um, especially just kind of uh, testing the, uh, the temperature of what people were reacting to online, I got a lot of people saying, this is actually really cool. Um, you know, obviously, Mac OS gives you a, quite a bit of customization, how, how you want to launch things, how you want things to look, how you want to, how you want to use your launch pad, et cetera. But I feel like this makes it more customizable than ever, really. Um, I don't know. I was talking to a couple of people online, like, yeah, like why, why would, you know, anybody get a Mac, spend all that money and they just like, let the dock be <laughs> hidden at the bottom of the screen <laughs> in the default mode. A lot of people like that. Sure. But uh, I think you kind of have to make it yours. Yeah. So I hide the desktop, the icons, and I'm actually a fan of, and I'm pretty sure maybe one of the few people that actually uses the swipe gestures to swipe between desktops, oh, yeah. but I always forget <laughs> in which order. So I'm just sitting here like, swiping <laughs> trying to <laughs> figure out where my All screen right. my de so this stage man I de I'm definitely going to give that a try because I'm one of those people are that not I don't want to use OCD because there are people out there who really have OCD so I don't want to <laughs> but I'm very particular I put mm -hmm. it like that as far as yeah. how I do work well so the, I think that's fair right and then like uh, Tom mentioned uh, definitely being able to use my expensive <laughs> iPhone as the probably the best webcam that I probably have, you know, I have a nice webcam, but it's nowhere near an iPhone camera. So why not be able to use that for, you know, video conferencing, like teams, any sort of those collaboration, FaceTime, that sort of thing. So I'm definitely looking out for those things. And then finally, um, I saw a tweet to so where somebody mentioned, oh, Apple finally remembered that they have a mail app. Because the oh gosh. the schedule yeah. sending and the reminders and the undo send, I think it's like a default feature for pretty much every other mail app versus than just the mail app from Apple. So they're finally catching up and saying, hey, we do email as well. Yeah. Yeah, Nika, what about you? Uh, stage manager, I think I tweeted that was probably the biggest feature for me. But I also like the desk view. Um, I, the whole idea with the continuity of being able to have your, your regular, you know, forward facing view, but also just being able to use that separate camera just to kind of get a little flip down view. If you're writing something, if you have like a piece of hardware or something you're trying to show, or if you're doing, you know, tutorial or anything like that, you can actually have 
the hardware visible relatively easy rather than having to set up a different angle, a different camera, tilt it down, those types of things. So those are probably my my two biggest ones. Yeah. They're, uh, they're, they're Sherlocking a bunch of, of apps that already do this. Right. Uh, and, and if it works really well, then, you know, that's going to send a bunch of apps uh, off into the sunset, uh, which is not unusual. Apple, Apple does that, uh, from time to time. So we'll, we'll see how well this works. Sidecar works pretty well. If this works as well or better than that, yeah. then I think it's okay. If not, I don't know. Yeah. Sidecar tries a little bit too hard sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, let's talk about iOS 16. Customizable lock screens. You can have more than one lock screen, in fact, kind of like watch faces. You can swipe between them. Uh, also, messages gets an edit and undo send button. Somebody uh, at the Verge live blog joked that messages got edit before Twitter did. Uh, notifications will roll in from the bottom in iOS 16, and some of them will be able to persist and update without having to give you multiple notifications. They used scores of a, of a basketball game as a good example of that. Instead of constantly getting updated on the score, it'll just persist and show you the score and what the latest play was, something like that. Uh, you can opt in push notifications for websites now in Safari on iOS 16. Uh, safety check is another new feature that makes it easier to reset who you share your accounts and passwords with. Uh, and, uh, live text is getting some updates so you can translate within the camera. And Maps gets multi-stop routing, and you can send routes from a desktop to an iPhone. Uh, this will all require an iPhone 8 or later. Uh, iPhone 16, or I'm sorry, iOS 16 will not be available for the 6S, the SE Original, or the iPhone 7. Those will now be stuck on iOS 15. Uh, betas for this, and by the way, for, for Ventura and the iPad OS that we're going to talk about, all coming in July with full releases coming later this year. Uh, Sarah, uh, what's got you excited about iOS 16? Well, I mean, I, I hate to say like cool multiple lock screens, but I actually, I actually do like the idea of that. I feel like the lock screen is very personality based and you might want different, uh, widgets, um, and, and, uh, you know, certain things depending on what you're doing at any given time, notifications rolling in from the bottom. I'm going to have to get used to that. You know, when I first heard that, I was like, oh, no, that's not. I mean, swipe down. That's all I do. That's all I do all day. That's where my notifications come from. But you get used to these things pretty quickly. Uh, Nika, Terrence, anything jump out at either of you as, as new and uh, potentially exciting or cool? Uh, I would say the live tiles. I mean, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say live tiles. Oh, I meant to say, oh, oh. <laughs> I meant to, I meant to say live. What is a Windows user? <laughs> live activities. <laughs> uh, definitely been looking forward to that um, for a long time since Windows Phone even introduced the live tiles idea. I mean, I thought that was just pretty dope. So for Apple to finally bring it in and just for the lock screen, I'm definitely looking forward to them actually eventually hopefully migrating that to other areas of iOS, but just to have it in the lock screen to where you can customize, like Tom mentioned, like the um, watch face and then even the complications to be able to add that there to where you can get at a glance information that's changing. Like they mentioned, uh, if you're uh, if you hail an Uber, you can actually on the lock screen, see where the car is and estimated times and things of that nature without having to open up the open up the phone unlock it, go into the mm -hmm. app and actually see that information, having that information there, as far as other, the things that you can customize on the lock screen, I think it's going to be the thing that most people do once iOS 16 arrives. Sounding like a broken record, the lock screen. When I first saw the live activities, the first thing that popped in my mind was Terrence. I was like, he's been hoping for something like this for, he's talking about it on our show for quite a bit. And I was like, it's finally, <laughs> you know, rolling its way in. But I think the redesign of the lock screen is definitely, I think it's definitely key for, for this release because they did include a lot of new things in that. And it's one of those things where having to, you know, they did the whole thing where you can unlock the phone with your mask on. Now you can put the things that you care about the most on your lock screen. So you don't have to necessarily worry about unlocking your phone to check a tax store to see like if Uber's coming or those types of things. So it just makes it a little bit easier to navigate and manage your phone with all of the other things that we have to kind of take into consideration. But to have it there at a quick view without having to swipe up and unlock or 
tap screen or to whatever it is to unlock your phone, depending on the device you have, I think it's one of those things that people are going to be very, I think it's going to be very useful and it's going to get a lot of use out of everybody. Yeah. And, and I think the way they tied it into focus mode, so you could have like a work lock screen and a weekend lock screen and a family time lock screen. I think people might use that. And the focus filters that do that to tabs in Safari and conversations and messages and, and mail, that that's interesting too. Uh, a couple other things to note here real quickly. Dictation uh, got a lot of updates. Uh, so if you're needing to talk, the keyboard will stay up and you can use the keyboard and dictation at the same time if you want to. A new developer API called App Intense lets developers use Siri with zero setup. That's going to be a big one. Also, Apple Wallet getting Apple Pay Later splits your cost into four equal payments. Buy Now Pay Later is a huge thing. Uh, and Apple coming for that is very interesting. Uh, uh, you're also getting some order tracking features and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, family sharing, quicker setup of parental controls, parental control quick start, screen time requests, stuff like that in there as well. Uh, a couple other uh, things that, that were packaged into that. Uh, they made a big deal that Matter is coming. Whenever Matter finally launches, Apple's oh. going to support matter. it yeah. uh, and carplay is going to work on multiple screen shapes and layouts uh coming to vehicles next year so that you will be able to customize widgets for say the the speedometer uh you know your gauges across an entire dashboard if the entire dashboard is a screen carplay can work across that entire screen i thought that was interesting yeah i think uh vehicles is it's a huge market now uh, everybody is getting into updating and fancifying, you know, vehicles. And I think this is just another way. I think in lieu of the Apple rumored Apple car, this is maybe their way as to saying, hey, we don't quite have the Apple car ready, but you can get a little bit of our mm. mojo in your current vehicle by using CarPlay. I was thinking that too. It's like, well, this is a side benefit of having worked on a car for 10 years is you got some, <laughs> you got some cool car interfaces right. showing up. Uh, all right, let's talk about Watch OS 9. Uh, you're getting uh, uh, the ability to have some new banner notifications, new Siri UI, some new running metrics, vertical oscillation, you know, how, how much up and down when you're running, stride length and ground contact time, heart rate zones. So you can say, keep me at 160 beats per minute for this long, then don't let me go below 140, stuff like that. Uh, customize your workout for running. You can you can add your own distance and time intervals, get haptic and voice alerts for those. That also is going to be available in the fitness app on iPhone. So you won't have to have a watch. Uh, you'll be able to use the iPhone motion sensors to take advantage of a lot of this because the fitness app is coming to all iPhone users. Uh, also adding sleep stages to the sleep tracking on the watch, REM, uh, REM sleep, core and deep sleep <laughs> stage. Uh, not not Michael Stipe sleep, but REM sleep. Uh, <laughs> They it should have called it Orange Crash. <laughs> it can contribute data to sleep studies if you want to help improve how useful this data is as well. Uh, there's also more details on tracking uh, AFib in your heart. Uh, it can tell you the time of day or week when your AFib is more frequent. If you're somebody that has it frequently, uh, you can share that with your doctor with a PDF. FDA clearance for that coming soon. And medication reminders. Uh, so that you can just scan the label of your prescription and it will add the reminder to the health app, look for any medication interactions with your other medications to alert you about. And uh, I was excited that Levothyroxin got a shout out in the screenshots because that's what I take. So it felt particularly noted to Personal. me. What about you, Sarah? <laughs> Uh, sleep stuff. I love it. I know a lot of people don't wear their Apple watches overnight uh, because you know, it's, it's some it, for some folks, it's not very comfortable. I have been tracking my sleep using my Fitbit app um, and my uh, my my Fitbit device for years now. And I mean, in the morning, that's one of the most interesting metrics I have. You know, maybe I call like I feel like I slept really well, and I kind of see like, okay, this is REM sleep. This was what Apple is calling core sleep, which is light sleep if you're using Fitbit and then you got your deep sleep you need all three you do um a, and a combination of all three as long as you're sleeping a certain amount of hours per night and you're not up and down and you know too hot or too cold all of that actually contributes to you having a much more pleasant day the next day so this is something that I've been waiting for with the Apple Watch because I thought that even though you know having only been an Apple Watch user for a couple of months now 
that was the one thing where I was like, they're really lagging behind Fitbit on this data because this data is really important to people, especially people like me who sort of suffer from chronic insomnia and want to know as much as we can about how to make it better. Yeah, so I don't. I'm one of those people that don't wear my Apple Watch when I sleep, me but I do wear my Apple Watch when I nap. So they need to come up with REM nap and deep nap <laughs> and rem, all these different stages I mean, for napping. Yeah, wouldn't you be able to be like sort of like the way that it's like, are you about to go on a run? You seem like it's like you've been you've been horizontal for some time. Are you about to, about take, to a take a nap? nap. Mm-hmm, Would you like yeah. us to track you're, you're that? Gonna have, you won't be able to notify it till you or or to act on it till you wake up. So it has to be like yeah, it looks like you just napping. took a nap. We tracked mm-hmm. it. Do you want us to record that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and in addition and, you know, to that's, that, that's yeah. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say in addition to that the medications that seems that seems like a perfect a perfect um, feature for the health app to have for people to be able to use their phone to track their medications me- medications how much they take you know reminders things like that and it seems like a perfect fit. Yeah, especially if you're taking multiples. For me, it's easy. Yeah. I've got one a day. I take it in the morning. But but you know, someday I'll have more because as you get older, you do, and and it helps to be able to track those. Nika, what about you? Um, the updates seem pretty okay. I mean, none of them really apply to me so much. I don't really. I was looking through the list, and when they were going through the announcement, I was like, mm, okay, mm, okay. Nothing really kind of jumps out at me for what I use my Apple Watch for. Uh, in some of these updates, but it sounds like I think specifically the medications, I think that can be very helpful for people. Um, so I think that's probably for me, probably the biggest thing that I think will will get a lot of a use out of folks for. All right, let's uh, finish up with iPad OS, iPad OS 16, uh, getting a weather app, which apparently got cheers in the the small in-person crowd uh, that was there and weather kit for developers now. Some collaboration stuff. So you can you can start a FaceTime call from within a doc, uh, share a link to everyone in a messages group that lets you start a, you know collaborating on a share sheet without having to just share a link to the doc itself. Uh, a sneak peek at a new app coming later this year for, for called Freeform, that is basically a whiteboarding app. So they're Sherlocking whiteboarding apps there. Uh, that'll be coming not only to the iPad, but iPhone and Mac too. Uh, some more about gaming, uh, the ability to do background background download uh, with an API, so you don't have to interrupt gaming uh, to do the downloads, uh, and inching towards true multitasking uh, with undo redo across the system, find and merging contacts, redesign find and replace customizable toolbars, virtual memory swap allows apps to address up to 16 gigabytes of memory and stage manager. That window management for the Mac is coming to the iPad along with full external display support and resizing windows when you're using stage manager, including overlapping windows on iPad OS, up to four of them. And you can have up to eight apps visible on a screen at once. Just almost like our true multitasking OS. For some time, uh, you know, you you read the articles of someone saying, I decided to forego my MacBook Pro. I'm a Mac user and I'm just using my iPad full time. And once upon a time that was like, well, what are the limitations? And now most people, even pro users are like, especially with the iPad Pro, like it's it's great. It It is a laptop. I don't even use my laptop anymore. Obviously form factor matters. Everybody has their preferences, but all of these updates just say to me, okay, well, if you want to use iPad OS as your, as your, as your main everyday computer, that's just Apple saying, all right, let's give you more of those pro tools that you would have previously said, well, I need my laptop for this. I got to, you know, pull that back out of the drawer. Exactly. When they, when they were going through the updates for iPad OS, I said, the gap is shrinking even more with each release. It's, it's, it's shrinking a little bit more and it's getting closer and closer to being again, synchronicity with the whole alignment. So I'm interested to see where it goes next, because again, the gap is narrowing so much the what's going to be the, I guess, the huge deciding factor now between, you know, a pro and a, a iPad pro. Not too much uh, as it relates to the price, because I was in the Apple store last week. Uh, my daughter went to one of those today sessions in Apple to where you can go and take the classes. And while she was doing her class, I was walking around looking at all the different products 
and the keyboard covers with the trackpad and the keyboard. I mean, it feels like a computer, but I just could not get over the price for that thing. It was like two or three hundred dollars. But if you're adding like an iPad Pro and you're using that keyboard cover and you have a mouse, it's almost exactly the same price as a MacBook Pro. So it's almost like that line is blurring even more when you consider all the things you need to actually say, I can use an iPad versus a MacBook. Yeah. All right, uh, let's let's wrap up our our, our final thoughts on the WWDC. Uh, mine is, I'm really glad they finished before two hours was up. Uh, they they, <laughs> they blazed yeah. through the announcements. Just barely, did they? Uh, <laughs> but but yeah, these uh, it was interesting to see them announce hardware, and and I thought the operating system announcements were not blowing me away, but they were all decent announcements. They were they were all all things that that I look forward to having access to. Sarah, what about you? Yeah, over the weekend, a friend of mine, I said, ooh, WWDC is on Monday. I have to remember that. And they were sort of like, what is that? And I said, well, developers conference. I mean, you get a lot of iOS stuff that we'll, you know, we'll all see, you know, potentially in the fall and what Apple might be working on. But yeah, no, no big like new iPhone. Still was an iPhone today, but there were some hardware announcements, and that is somewhat unusual. I think we're all in sort of unusual times for a lot of companies that are announcing things. But Apple stays pretty, you know, close close to the the chest when it comes to this sort of stuff. So I don't know how many huge surprises we got, but it was a more well-rounded announcement for the consumer folks. Yeah, I'd like to say I appreciate the fact that they are really making iOS more personalizable if that's a word, <laughs> um, giving you the ability. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Customizable. I was trying to mesh personalizable. To where it's really not a brand new OS. I think people are still kind of waiting for a brand new look to iOS versus just the lock screen and you go through the different apps, but being able to customize the lock screen, like we mentioned before, being able to do the focus mode for more than just uh, reminders and notifications, um, given all those features, I think is really Apple really saying, okay, we don't have a brand new OS, but let's, let's start with you personalizing the crap out of this one to get it exactly the way you like it. And I think I appreciate that the most. Yeah. And the personalization, I think we've talked about it many times before. It's like, I want to be able to control more of what my device looks like. So I think Apple heard that and they are, you know, giving people what they said they wanted. I will say I was a little bit surprised, and I guess because we have the whole week, that there, it wasn't hugely developer focused. And you would think the keynote for WWDC, which is a developer conference, would have more, I guess, dev focused mm -hmm. type of, of, of content. They did kind of throw in an, a new API here, a new API there. But um, I think I was a little bit surprised that it wasn't a little bit more dev centric because to me this was like a regular apple event for for consumers yeah no i was surprised by that too no mac pro i thought if we got an m2 we'd, we'd, we'd also get a mac pro uh because it's developers and developers use mac pro uh and and i thought we'd get maybe get reality os if not, you know, maybe not get the actual uh, AR VR headset, but but maybe get the beginning of the OS, and we and we didn't get at that least either. a mention or something. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> yeah, nothing. Well, Nika Monford and Terrence Gaines, always a pleasure to have you for Apple announcements and any other time as well. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but today was today was a lot of fun. Uh, Nika, let's start with you. Where can folks keep up with your work? I am pretty much uh, at Tech Savvy Diva on all social media. Um, I pretty much live on Twitter. You can find me there most of the time. And again, I am one half of the Snob West show. So you can definitely find us over there at snobwestcast.com. Yep, like Excellent. Nika, yeah, yep, go ahead, Terrence. Like Nika, the other half. I'm the other <laughs> half of the Snob West cast. Uh, you can find me at brothertech.com. That's where my website is. Even though I feel like websites are becoming obsolete to where everybody's just like, all right, well, just do Twitter. So like Nika mentioned, I'm mostly on Twitter. And in addition to the Snob OS cast, myself 
and uh, Stephanie Humphrey and Rob Dunwood, who have all been on this show. We have our own uh, podcast called The Tech John, where we talk all things tech, but from a diver- diverse perspective. So you can find us there at thetechjohn.com. Excellent. Uh, really good shows and always good to have you both here with us. Also, quick thanks to our brand new boss, Head Cleric of Crom. Head Cleric just started back at us on Patreon over the weekend. Thank you, good cleric. Uh, it's good to have a cleric in the party. Yeah. 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 I feel like we, we all benefit from that uh, in some way. <laughs> Thank you, Head Cleric. If you want to be like Head Cleric, become a patron. And we'll shut you out tomorrow. There's a longer version of this show called Good Day Internet. We roll right into it after our live show of DTNS. You can find out more at patreon.com slash DTNS. Just a reminder, we are live on the show Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back tomorrow with Dr. Nicole Ackermans joining us. Talk to you soon. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>